Greetings, everyone. Do you think we are living in the end times? And if so, are you ready? Welcome to my podcast, A Psychologist Looks at Scripture. My name is Peter Doherty. I'm a Catholic priest and a psychologist who integrates my training in psychology and scripture studies to help understand the Gospels from a different perspective and focus on new pastoral teachings for Christians. The Gospels are a rich source of learning about God and developing and deepening our spirituality. We are far from exhausting the learning potential. My podcasts are between 7 to 10 minutes in length, where I share insights and reflections that I hope will be useful to you. Please don't hesitate to contact me with questions or comments. Love to hear from you. Today's podcast is from Mark chapter 13, verse 24 to 32. This gospel will be read in churches November 17, 2024. Mark's gospel takes a dark turn. Many people interpret this gospel passage as a description of what the end times will be like, signs of impending doom of the world. Many people interpret the book of Revelation in this way too. Jesus did talk about the end times, and there was the belief that the second coming and final coming sorry, of the Messiah would happen within the lifetime of the early church. We all see this belief present in the writing of St. Paul. To better understand Paul, Paul's teaching, it is wise to consider the social context of his time. He, like many other believers, expected the end times to occur in his own lifetime. The main focus of Jesus' ministry was on conversion, love, and service. This gospel was written almost 2,000 years ago, and the world is still here, so I am less convinced the readings were written to prepare us for the end times. However, many of the early Christians understood these readings as a sign pointing to the end of the world. One of the reasons why the gospels were written so late was because many people believed Jesus literally and that the end of the world would take place in their lifetime, so there was no need to write anything down. I suspect these readings could be interpreted differently. I propose that Jesus is talking more about the trials and tribulations in our lives. Our faith in Jesus does not exempt us from the struggles. Rather than seeing these as the end, Jesus invites us to see this as a time when God will show us his saving power. Indeed, it is in time of struggle or adversity that we are most likely to see the hand of God in our lives. These readings are meant to encourage us rather than to frighten us. I wonder what the role of trials and tribulations is in our lives. I don't think God gives us trials to annoy us or even to test us. Actually, I don't think God gives us trials, but we are confronted by them nevertheless. I'm thinking of St. Paul, who refers to himself as having a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. But Paul sees value in the thorn. Many have speculated what the thorn was but we don't know for sure what the thorn was. I cannot help and wonder if somehow the thorn impacted his ministry for the better. Most of us have struggles and issues in our lives that we wish God would deliver us from. Could these struggles be actually helpful in our spiritual growth? Struggles encourage us to develop resilience and problem-solving skills. Struggles can lead to maturity and to a perspective on life that leads to spiritual and psychological growth. Of course, I don't encourage struggles, and we know that Jesus himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion that he could be free from the suffering. So yes, pray for deliverance, but I urge you to also pray for the eyes of faith, to see the lesson, and pray for the ears of faith to hear the promptings of the Spirit when confronted with struggles and challenges. I realize that not everyone responds to trials and tribulations with the hope of spiritual growth. Some allow their pain and suffering to lead to bitterness. In the second part of the Gospel, Jesus teaches us to be alert to the signs around us. There are many scripture passages where we are called to be alert and ready. I seriously doubt that God is trying to catch us off guard, like a gotcha moment. God is not calling us to be hypervigilant, but rather be aware of what is going on around us. Some of the simplest of signs can be a source of direction for us. Voltaire, a prominent French Enlightenment writer and philosopher, is believed to have said that God created us, created us in his own image, and for the last 2,000 years, we've been returning the favor. His clever line captures the reality that we project onto God what we want. So often I've heard someone say, 
I know it was God's will, as I felt so calm and at peace afterwards. I point out that yes, this could indeed be a sign of God's will, but it also could be a sign of relief that they have managed to convince themselves that God wants what they want. I have learned that not getting what we want could actually be in our best interests. God seldom, if ever, yells at us. It is the exact opposite. An excellent example of how God speaks to us can be found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 13. In this passage, the prophet Elijah is instructed to go, by God to stand on the mountain, where he will experience a series of powerful natural phenomena. There is a strong wind that shakes the mountain and shatters rocks. Later, there is an earthquake followed by the wind. A fire follows the earthquake. However, the Lord is not present in any of these dramatic displays. Instead, after the fire, there comes a gentle breeze, or also translated, a small voice. And it is in this subtle manifestation that Elijah recognizes God's presence. God's choice to appear in a gentle whisper symbolizes a quiet and intimate relationship. While we might have anticipated God's presence in the loud and dramatic events, God instead chose to reveal himself through stillness. This scripture passage teaches us that the divine communication can occur in subtle ways, encouraging believers to be attentive to quieter moments where God may be present. The choice of a gentle breeze can underscore the idea that God's presence transcends human expectations of power. God is not confined to grand displays, but can be found in moments of peace and calm. This shift from chaos to tranquility It illustrates that God's voice can be discerned amidst life's challenging experiences, guiding individuals back to their purpose and mission. The subtle manifestation of God's presence is so easily missed in our rush that is so typical in our daily lives. The busyness of our lives is most evident when we try to pray. Our minds may start to race. People may be surprised to know that their mind was always racing. It's only by slowing down that we spend more time listening to the internal dialogue of thinking that's going on in our minds. Lowering the volume of that confusion and chatter will involve your determination and focus. There are so many opposing opposing voices out there. People frequently miss the signs because they were not expecting the signs. The scribes and the Pharisees made the same mistake. Jesus did not behave in the way they were expecting, so they did not recognize him. I urge you to ask yourself, what signs are you looking for? Are you open to finding God in places you were not expecting? We have to make the effort. Meditation and reflection are good for us psychologically and emotionally. People seem to give up so quickly, believing that they are not getting any benefit for pausing in their life. The time is often believed to be better spent doing something productive. I want to return to the passage Jesus talks about trials and tribulations and the second coming. Many people interpret this to mean that the end times will be quite violent, but then Jesus will appear. The gospel was written 2,000 years ago, and the second coming has not yet happened. Is it possible that Jesus is talking about our spiritual lives? After trials and tribulations, our faith and spiritual life can grow. I'm not suggesting that one should seek out tribulations. Perhaps dealing with losses and tribulations may lead to maturity and growth. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join me next week when I examine the Gospel of John who describes Jesus being confronted by Pilate, who is questioning him about the kingdom of God. If this is the first time you've heard my podcast and you're interested in hearing more, I urge you to listen to my podcast listed on the website. Every Sunday, I release a new podcast focusing on the gospel for the following week. I invite you to listen to all the podcasts, and I hope the reflections are useful useful to you. The podcast, A Psychologist Looks at Scripture, is found in most platforms that carry podcasts. The podcast is also available on YouTube. Please don't hesitate to leave a review. Feedback from my listeners can be helpful in the development of the podcast. I'd also like to thank my team, Heather patel Doherty and Richard Coulomb, who play an important part in the preparation of this, gosp- of this podcast. If you have any questions or concerns, I can be reached by email at peter.doherty, O-M-I, that's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y, O-M-I, at gmail.com. God bless and have a great week.